you went down to the South Island at some point that day. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That was 1947. That was the year to remember. We went to the South Island on the Rangatira to, to Christchurch, the ferry ran, and we went over with intent to walk the Milford Track because a friend of ours, Reg Gilbert, his family knew a, a family who ran a cattle station on the, in the Holyford Valley. So anyway, I got interested in that. So I went with me and my brother, Len Sutton, and who else? Um, Ian Connor. Four of us went down. And we went and we got over to... Uh, we went to Te uh, Wakatip. And like, from Wakatip we So that was to Christchurch by boat, yeah, from Wellington, and then from the, Wellington by... Sir, from sir, Christchurch by train? Bus, no train. Okay, by, by bus. bus yeah, south. through Cromwell, through central Otago to uh, Wakatip, to Queenstown. Right. Yep. Then from Queenstown we got the boat, the yep. old Earns Law, yep. sort of running the... right to Kinloch at the top. Oh, okay. And we got off at Kinloch. Bill will continue the story shortly from where the Earns Law drops them off at Kinloch at the top of Lake Wakatipu. But there are a lot of photos from Dad's album taken between Christchurch and Kinloch, which are included here. First there are photos of Christchurch Cathedral and the modern electric trolley buses that ran at the time, plus the Avon River and the Botanic Gardens. Timaru must have been the next stop because we see a photo of Timaru Main Street and the very impressive Dunedin Railway Station. It's then inland through central Otago where we see a photograph of drought country and rabbits, plus the Omarama Hotel where the bus must have stopped for a break. Quite a few photos were then taken in and around Queenstown on the banks of Lake Wakatipu. We see the main street of Queenstown and also a postcard that features the town and the lake and the mountain range behind the Remarkables. Plus a selection of photographs of a small dinghy they hired for the day. There's even a photograph of them travelling along at top speed, which Dad describes with, again, the remarkable mountains in the background. They stayed at the Queenstown Motor Park, and here's a view of the remarkables and the town from the motor park. They went to the Botanic Gardens, and here's a photograph of the monument to Robert Scott, of the Antarctic, plus a World War I gun, which apparently is no longer in the gardens. They stayed at the motor park and, and here are their tents. There are some big redwood trees in Queenstown and here they are standing out the front of the redwood tree out the front of the courthouse. The tree is still there 73 years later. We now see a photograph of the hire car the four men rented. And I remember Dad telling me about this once. As Dad explained, they wanted to go to the Skipper's Canyon Road. But the main condition of the rental agreement was that it would not be taken on the Skipper's Road. Well, here are some photographs of the car down the Skipper's Road. Just for the record, I did a web search of the Skipper's Road and it's listed as New Zealand's most dangerous road. I also searched for rental cars and Skipper's Road and appears the ban is still in place. Have a look at Bill's photos plus those online and you'll understand why. When we got off there, there'd been a terrific rainstorm and the, and the roads had been cut. So we couldn't go up, we were going to go through the Rootburn track over the Rootburn Valley. So we spent a couple of days sleeping on the house of the road foreman, helping him repair the road. He had an old truck, uh, us boys giving a hand and they, they fed us, right? There lots of washaways and everything. There's a, there's a suspension bridge over the Rootburn River, we had to cr cross that to get onto the track proper. Because the Rootburn River runs in, it runs into the head of Lake Wakatip, right? 
So that was a bad start, really. Because anyway, it wasn't wasn't too bad. We had shelter in the foreman's house. Anyway, the weather cleared up, and thereafter it was pretty good. We walked the Rootburn track into the Hollyford Valley, down to Lake Howden, Lake Mackenzie. It was all pretty rough country. There wasn't there too many people walking then. This is. 1947 because they hadn't got the track back after the war. Nothing had been done in, in the six years of the war and they're only just starting on fixing the tracks up. Bill will pick up the story again shortly from the Homer Tunnel at the end of the Rootburn track. Looking at the map, the lads have now completed the red section from the top of Lake Wakatipu and the Rootburn Valley up and over into the Holyford Valley. They're about to start the yellow track through the unopened Homer Tunnel down into Milford Sound, which at the time was only accessible by sea. It is here at Milford Sound they meet with a rude shock, which Dad will describe. But first, here are Dad's photos taken along the trail. When we got to Hollyford, Hollyford Valley, we got to the Homer, the Homer Tunnel, and the whole village there had been left at the start of the war. You could just pick any hut you wanted and camp in it, which we did. The, the hole through the Homer Tunnel in, to Milford Sound was just a bored, rough, rough rock hole. In fact, in, inside there was machinery just abandoned at the beginning of the war, so they started that job in the late 30s and uh, it hadn't been completed except the hole had been bored through. It was a very rough walk through it. So we walked through there down to Milford Sound which is probably five or six miles from the other entrance of the tunnel. We got to Milford Hostel and we, we, we bargained on buying bread there. Well the manager said immediately you are not allowed on the Milford track. The Milford track is not open. You cannot, you'll have to go back the way you come. The only way in here is by sea. There's no, there's no provision, you cannot buy anything from us. And he was very anti-us, anti-us walking the Milford track. He said the track is being repaired and uh, the only people who go out there are workers right working on the track. So we, by this time we met two blokes, one had been in the army and the other, his friend said, you know, what are we going to do? He sort of joined up with us. He said, oh, I haven't been away six years in the army to be told by that bloke we can't go on the Milford track. So he was a natural leader. And we come up with a plan. We squatted on the beat. We couldn't build a raft. There was nothing to build a raft because you've got to cross from Milford to Lake Ada. We couldn't build a raft. There was no, all the timber would just sink. It was all wet. So we come up with the idea. We take a day trip, a day fishing trip. Now, on a, on a boat which ran. There was a few tourists in the hotel. They come only by sea though. 
So we uh, we got on this fishing boat for a day trip fishing, and when we got over the other side to Sandfly Point, it's called, nice name, well named, Sandflies are awful there, terrible. We got off, we had lunch, and got off the boat and just went into the bush and never came back. We took some fish with us as a extra rations because we didn't have any rations. We had just enough, to, we had hardly enough to last. But it takes at least three days on Norton when the track's in good nick to walk it. So we got into the bush and the first hut we came to, uh, Lake Ada, it's called, I forget its name now. Anyway, we said, well, we've got to be very careful here because there's track workers and the word's going to get back to the manager at Milford that we're illegally on the track. So we walked uh, We walked early morning and lay up during the day and walked late afternoon when we knew that the workers wouldn't be working. So we did that and we walked up to as far as Pompolona Hut. That was right, we walked by there. Some of the huts are very get, very hard to get by because there's a ravine comes in and you and they've got dogs in them too, so we, with their shoes around their neck and barefoot, we'd sneak past a hut in Pompaluna, I remember. The dogs start barking when you just got to keep going, right? And uh, someone would know, or perhaps they'd think it was a possum or something in the bush. <clears throat> when we got to, uh, we got to the big uh, Jervois Glacier, which is McKinnon's Pass to go over, um, our leader, I just forget his name now, said, well, look, I'll go ahead and reconnoitre. We can't go past it. Someone will see us. He said, but I'll go up and find out the lay of the land. There's someone up there for sure. So he, we left us we left us in the bush. We were hidden well off the track in case there's any, any track workers or any officials came by. So he went and he came back after oh, two or three hours and said, it's OK, there's a Maori bloke up there. His, his track is absolutely perfect, three or four hundred yards of his side side of his heart. Then it deteriorates into bush again. Not, there's not much bush there at all. He said, that bloke hates the manager at Milford. He said he's had a phone message on the landline. There was a single wire, you know, the old-fashioned line, landline going through. He said, oh, I've got to keep a lookout for you blokes. And tell the manager that you're here and I've got to detain you there somehow or other. He said, he can go and get, you know what, right in rude language. <laughs> he said, he's a good bloke. He's come up and he's got plenty of tucker there. He's got lots of cans of food kept for mountain people are lost and he'll feed us as well. So we all come out of the scrub and we all, you know, the six of us there landed in his hut. He makes a great big stew and a kerosene tin and we hop into that. We were living on a few haricot beans. We couldn't catch any fish and we virtually had some rice that we're really on starvation rations. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, the Maori track worker gave us some food to to help us on our way, and we continued on down the Clinton Canyon and came came to Lake Tiana, past Lighthouse. Now the problem arose: how do we get down to Tiana? Because we didn't know when the boat was arriving, so we sat down on the beach. A bit of fire, smoky fire to keep the mosquitoes and sand flies away. And after a couple of days, the boat came up. Great house with tourists just to, for a day trip. And we got off. We got onto the boat and we had enough money. We just marched on the boat and said, Could we have a fare down to Tiana, please? And he was greatly surprised, the launch master to see the six boats just walk on the boat. Where, where had they come from? Well, he didn't worry too much as long as he got his fare, which we had. And then we got the boat down to Tiana and the bus back to Christchurch, and we went back to work for a rest. The end of our holidays was a, a very, very physically demanding thing.